Hello there, this is Christy Lewis from Dostoevsky in Space. Today I am coming at you with a breakdown of a Dostoevsky story. Yes, thank you. We're talking today about conversations in a graveyard, also known as Bobak. It's included in A Bad Business Essential Stories. It's also freely available online. I will link it down below. We're reading it for a read-along right now with the Literary Discourse Discord, which is also linked down below. I don't know if I'll do more videos on it or not, but every time I read one of these stories, it makes me want to do a video on it, so maybe you'll see more. But I do, regardless, have lots of just Dostoevsky content on this channel in case you're just discovering this video. I love him. That's why my channel is named after him. So let's jump into this short story, shall we? Conversations in a Graveyard is a hilarious Menippean satire that reminds me of what I've read of the posthumous memoirs of Bras Kubas. Not because I think that that is a Menippean satire. I really don't know, but the tone is kind of similar. And there's also a scene in Mulan where all of her ancestors come to life to kind of debate the actions of their progeny. And that, that Kate from the Literary Apothecary, who was one of our co-hosts, I think it was her who said that this reminded her of Mulan. And I was like, yes, exactly. So we will discuss Menopan satire in a little while. But for now, let's jump into a summary of the story. So this is about a writer who is hard up for story ideas that will sell in St. Petersburg. He has all kinds of complaints to make about the society in St. Petersburg. Like it sure knows how to drive a man crazy. So he says, and come to think of it, he's been here Hearing voices. He's been hearing a voice saying, Bobak, Bobak. What could that ever mean? And also his writing style is changing. Is he going crazy or what? So we'll dig into his complaints in this section a little bit more later on in the story. But this section where he's just randomly critiquing society, it's just like a, a string of complaints he has about society. That is also a feature in Menopan satire, which we will talk about. So he's bored one night and he heads out of the house and he catches a funeral of someone that he doesn't really care about. There are so many bodies in this graveyard, he says, like, and they smell. <laughs> it's like, dude, what do you expect? So one of the details here while he's in the graveyard really caught me. Somebody is digging a grave or being buried in a grave or something. Anyways, he sees an open grave and it's full of water. Now, this I know from reading The Sinner and the Saint, which is a sort of biography of Fyodor Dostoevsky that recently came out this year. And it talks about how St. Petersburg was built on the mouth of the Neva River and it floods all the time. And during floods, you can sometimes see coffins just floating down the street because basically the city is built on stilts in the mud. And so when you bury the grave, when you bury the coffins, they're just in mud that sheds when it floods. <laughs> so I think this is why it mentions that the third class graves are, th these are the third class graves that are outside being flooded. There are some rich people like closer to the church or in the church or something. I'm guessing that's why. I'm guessing it's because they don't want to be flooded. <laughs> so now we're getting to the meat of the story. It starts now. Our hero, whose name by the way is Ivan, there's a proliferation of Ivans in this short story collection and also in Russian literature in general. Just get ready to hear that name all the time. Ivan goes and lays down on a gravestone for a while. That's weird but he does it and there's just like a half-eaten sandwich sitting there so he flicks it off of the grave and then suddenly he starts hearing voices he says they're padded like like their faces are pressed against a pad he's hearing their voices and they're kind of distorted and he figures out that it's coming from below him in the graves there are people talking down there and their talk is rather shall we say banal <laughs> there's a writer in line who used the word banal to describe the talk of the dead people and i think that's the perfect word these people are wicked and boring and just going on about the life that they just left. Concerns of above the ground, not below the ground, right? They're talking about life before death and heaven forbid you mention life after death because they don't want to hear it. So they're just being wicked. They're just planning to party it up and you know, not think too much about the afterlife. When suddenly Yvonne sneezes and the dead stop talking and he wonders why. He's like, they can't possibly be ashamed, right? After making all this noise about not being ashamed, you know, basically what they're saying the whole time when they're under the ground is we're going to shed all of our pretensions of morality or worries about morality and we're just going to party it up with the rest of the time that we have. So he's like, they can't possibly be like 
ashamed of hearing me. Why are they so quiet? We'll get into some more discussion of that. What he knows for sure though is this. He has a great new source for his writing. He learned a lot while listening to them, including some great administrative news, which <laughs> I'm not even sure where Dostoevsky is trying to hit at this moment, but I'm sure that's, uh, you know, some kind of strike against Russia's bureaucracy because it was extremely bureaucratic at the time. People would just be promoted based on their families, not based on merit. So there was a lot of people that were advancing that really wouldn't be in a merit-based system. They were not good at their jobs. So maybe that's what he's talking about. I'm not really sure. But regardless, he's gonna write their biographies. He's gonna share all the anecdotes that they're sharing. Like he's definitely planning on coming back. This is the phenomena he was looking to write about. So let's get into the genre before we dig into more analysis. So it's Menape and Satire. Menape and Satire, which I am so sorry about the pronunciation. I'm completely positive I'm mispronouncing it. I don't know how it's pronounced. So anyways, this is not a term that I was familiar with before reading this story. So I went ahead and read a Britannical article on it because I specifically wanted to understand the story better. So Menapean satire is a satire of ideas and conventions, not people. It usually involves unique and arresting settings like a descent into Hades, or in this case, a graveyard full of talking corpses. It can also contain long digressions on subjects that have nothing to do with the plot, which is also a device Dostoevsky uses to release some of that pent up mockery that just seems to flow through his system like blood. Specifically, Britannica says, long digressions in which the author airs his views on topics having nothing to do with the plot is in the Menippean tradition. So, okay, analysis. This is very clouded. Is this the ironic ravings of a madman? Was Yvonne mad? Was he dreaming? Like, he does even say that the faces of the dead give him dreams. So was he dreaming while he was on the gravestone? I have done research on Dostoevsky and some of his beliefs, so some of my analysis will be based on that but honestly he's he's so concerned with also entertaining you and he's just so ironic and wild whenever he's writing uh that it can be kind of hard to interpret what he is saying so either he's kind of like the ben shapiro of his day just calling out all these problems with society all the ills of society or he's absolutely mocking everything nihilistically and i know that some people would probably go with the nihilism answer but i really do believe that Dostoevsky hated nihilism and wrote against it and that again is based on reading biographies and reading other works of his but this is really what I believe I'm going to share that there's a lot of irony in the fact that this writer is giving us advice in the beginning and then in the end he goes against what he says in the beginning in the beginning he says that what is printed should be dignified and there should be ideals but then he makes these extremely banal voices of the dead into his next source this is an important thing about Dostoevsky's characters. Sometimes they'll make a good point, but they are often disappointing people as a whole. They're not like Ayn Rand's characters in the sense that they represent ideas so strongly that they never act against the idea. Her characters also, I believe, are very interesting in regards to the Russian tradition. I think that that is something she picked up honestly from the Russian writing tradition. But Dostoevsky is much more nuanced with his character work. Ayn Rand's characters are ideas. Um, whereas Dostoevsky's characters, while ideas, they also have their own personality quirks. And in the beginning of the story, he mentions that an artist draws him not as he originally thought due to his literary fame, but because he has two symmetrical warts on his head. And then the painter exhibits the portrait and says, come look at this morbid, half mad face. This is what set off Ivan. He complains that people have no ideas. They just want to portray phenomena these days and they call it realism. Like clearly this is his complaint. He's like, where are the ideas? I'm bored and nobody will buy my stuff. Something that I just noticed about this is it's kind of funny that people are calling it realism when they go and search out these phenomena and write about it or draw it or whatever because it's like this is out of the norm and you're saying it's realism like how is that representative of real life if you're just picking these phenomena anyways he also talks about how half of what he's doing lately is translating French now a lot of higher class Russians spoke French because it was considered more cultured and cultivated than speaking Russian this is something that I learned actually while I was reading 
War and Peace by Leo Tolstoy, all these characters in like the drawing rooms of St. Petersburg would suddenly break into French. So it is conceivable here that our author is annoyed that everybody's willing to listen to French ideas, but they won't listen to my ideas. Even when I want to paraphrase some French, like Voltaire, they don't want to listen. Who wants Voltaire these days? What they want is a cudgel to knock every last tooth out of each other's heads. I'm sure that also is a direct hit against some Russian writer or <laughs> literary journal, maybe just the tone of the writing at the time, which sounds familiar, does it not? He also complains about people sounding off about things that they don't even know what they're talking about. They're just like normal civilian peoples, but they're talking like they know like details about, I don't know, engineering or something. And another thing, to be surprised at everything is stupid, of course. And to be astonished at nothing is a great deal more becoming and for some reason accepted as good form. But that is not really true. To my mind, to be astonished at nothing is much more stupid than to be astonished at everything. And moreover, to be astonished at nothing is almost the same as feeling respect for nothing. And indeed, a stupid man is incapable of feeling respect. And I think this is kind of a dig at the ghosts later in the story who are just as banal as they were in real life. He's kind of talking about how people who are just so urbane and blasé about the phenomena of life, they should maybe think a little harder use the brains. And especially in a situation like what the ghosts are in, they're like in their last moments before completely disappearing off of the earth entirely. Maybe they should think over their dirty rotten lives, but instead they're arguing and playing cards and determining to live out their last bit of life as raucously as possible. And that bothers him. So I stylistically give a little bit more weight to the commentary surrounding the ghosts and within the section of the ghosts, because Dostoevsky does, like I said, what he frequently does in literature. He makes characters into ideas. So the different ghosts kind of represent somewhat different ideas. And I am not cool enough to be able to tell you what all of those ideas are, but you can just tell that they're all arguing from different standpoints. So there's a section in here where one of the men says, I know why we all stink. It's a moral stench. <laughs> so we are addressing the stench of the bodies in the graveyard. This section I definitely paid a a little bit more attention to. Well, and how is it that I have no sense of smell and yet I feel there's a stench? That, hehe, <laughs> well, on that point, our philosopher is a bit foggy. It's apropos of smell, he said, that the stench one perceives here is, so to speak, moral. Hehe. <laughs> It's the stench of the soul, he says, that in these two or three months, it may have time to recover itself. That is, so to speak, the last mercy. Enough! All the rest of it, I am sure, is nonsense. The great thing is that we have two or three more months of life, and then, Bobak! I propose to spend these two months as agreeably as possible, and so to arrange everything on a new basis. Gentlemen, I propose to cast aside all shame. So, we have a bit of an argument going on about how they should be living their last moments here on Earth. I do believe, based on the biography, that Dostoevsky was ideologically very opposed to nihilism, and he loved to kind of tackle it in his fiction, but he would often choose very flawed narrators to kind of convey his ideas, such as for example, Prince Mishkin in The Idiot, who was goodness incarnate, but everybody thought he was an idiot because he was kind of socially inept. Or in Crime and Punishment, it's a prostitute who's telling a murderer the gospel and who ends up saving his spiritual life by sharing that with him. Or the protagonist of the first story in this here collection, the story A Bad Business. He's a ridiculous fool, but his self-revelation at the end of the story kind of hits home. It hits hard for anybody who has ever been in that situation where you realized how hypocritical you really are. And he says, I must conclude that they had some secret unknown to the living, which they carefully concealed from every mortal. He is not troubled about Bobak, which I'm thinking is standing in for the afterlife or hell or maybe heaven, but I think probably hell. But then he's really startled. He says, depravity in such a place depravity of the last aspirations, depravity of sodden and rotten corpses, and not even sparing the last moments of consciousness. These moments have been granted, vouchsafed to them, and, and worst of all, in such a place. No, that I cannot admit. I shall go to the other tombs. I shall listen everywhere. Certainly one ought to listen everywhere, and not merely at one spot in order to form an idea. Perhaps one may come across something 
reassuring. So he wants to find out the secret that the dead people are aware of and can't share with the living. And he's hoping that he won't find such depravity everywhere. And that's kind of, that's, that's the end. So th those are my thoughts on the story. It's not as tight in the moral argument as a bad business, but so like wildly entertaining that I wanted to reread it. So I reread it and that helped me kind of pick out his argument that perhaps St. Petersburg is a very depraved place, that everybody is just some level of depravity, but that there is some secret after death. In this case, the writer, he's a fool in some ways, but he stumbled across this scene of in between life, after death, before afterlife. And so it kind of makes us kind of like reflective as well, I think, about our lives as we read the story. What did you guys think about the story? Let me know all of your thoughts down below. I can't wait to hear. Thanks so much, guys. I'll talk to you next time. Bye-bye.